I'm sorry I don't speak Slovenian. I should learn it since I now live in Trieste. Uh, my name is Franco Zanini. I'm a research scientist at Sintotrone Trieste, uh, which is a research laboratory one hour from here. Lep pozdrav vsem, se opravičujem, da ne govorim slovensko, kar bi sicer bilo prav, ker sedaj živim v Trstu, kjer tudi delam, delam v Sinhrotronu in ve se, da je to nedaleč od nas eno uro vožnje. This is the place where, uh, where, I, where I work, in front of this Adriatic Sea that we, that we all, uh, all share. Uh, it's a nice place in the middle of the countryside, but it's one of the, of the most advanced laboratory of this field in the world. No, to je moje delovno mesto, kot vidite naše skupno Jadransko morje in čeprav je vse tako lepo na vasi in na podeželju, je to tudi na tem področju eden izmed najnaprednejših laboratorijev na svetu. Uh, what is a synchrotron in, uh, in easy words? Uh, a synchrotron is a machine which generates a very intense, very bright uh, beams of light uh, by light, mean, I mean infrared, uh, ultraviolet, uh, visible light, X-rays, uh, accelerating particles through strong magnetic fields. In kaj je sinhrotron, ko govorimo o sinhrotronu? Sinhrotron je preprosto naprava, ki proizvaja, pospešuje delce in pri tem proizvaja zelo intenzivno in zelo svetlo, svetlobo. In ko govorimo o svetlobi, govorimo o selotnem spektru, torej začnemo od infrairdeče, prekvidne svetlobe do ultraviolične in x žarko. How does it look inside? Uh, here you can see the inside of the accelerator. All these magnets keep electrons running very, very fast inside a ring where the vacuum has been made. Tako to zgleda znotraj. No, to je to. To je en naš obroč, v katerem imamo magnete, ki skrbijo samo zato, da se elektroni zelo močno giblejo v tej srednjem krogu, ki je pa, kjer pa imamo vakuum. How does it work? The electrons are generated in a, in a cathode at the beginning of the ring. Kako to deluje? Torej, pri številki ena imamo katodno cev, ki proizvede elektrone. They are initially accelerated in a linac, which is a linear accelerator. Potem pa jih pospešimo najprej z enim linearnim pospeševalnikom, to je številka tam po, po dvojki. They go inside the first ring, which we call a booster ring, which accelerates these particles almost at the speed of light. So 300,000 kilometers per second. Potem pa imamo prvi notranji krok, ki mu pravimo booster, kar je spet pospeševalnik in ta krok pospekrbi zato, da elektrone pospeši na skoraj hitrost svetlobe. Torej, svetlobno hitrost, to je 300 tisoč kilometrov na sekundo. Then they are finally transferred in the storage ring, where they are kept flying at this speed for uh, one, two, three days. Potem pa jih prenesemo, jih spustimo v zunanji obroč, v shranjevalni obroč, kjer jih ohranjamo pri tej hitrosti, recimo, en, dva, tri dni. Every time an electron uh, passes through a magnetic field, it's deviated from its trajectory and emits photons along this trajectory. Vsakič, ko elektron pride, v neko magnetno polje, to magnetno polje ukrivi njegovo pot. In zaradi tega, ker ga prisili, da spremeni smer, izgubi neka energije in izpusti iz sebe en foton ali dva. And this light, these photons, are emitted in a very small cone, just like a laser beam. In ti fotoni, ki jih izgubljamo na sinhrotronu, ki pršijo ven iz tega zunanjega shranjevalnega kroga, se prihajajo ven v zelo tenkih, oskih snopih, tako kot laserska svetloba. Why is synchrotron light so important for us, for us scientists? Well, these are the most important characteristics of synchrotron radiation. In zakaj, so tem, zakaj svetloba sinhrotrona za nas, znanstvenike, tako pomembna? No, tukaj sem skušal našteti vsaj teh pet osnovnih, temeljnih razlogov, zaradi katerih je na, ta svetloba za nas tako pomembna. First, it's a very brilliant beam, which means that there are 
uh, many orders of magnitude brighter than conventional source, which means that they are millions, billions times more intense than sources that you can find, for example, in an hospital. Prvič zato, ker gre za zelo intenzivno, zelo svetlo, svetlobo. Nekaj razredo v velikosti več kot najmočnejša svetloba. Na milijone ali milijardo krat močnejše od svetlobnih virov, ki jih recimo uporabljajo v bolnišnicah. They have a continuous spectrum, which means that they are tunable, from, as I said before, from infrared to hard X-rays. In na druga stvar je, da gre za zvezen spekter, torej nimamo lukenj v spektru in lahko jo torej prilagodimo in dobimo vse frekvence luči, svetlobe, od, kot sem že rekel, infrardeče do mehke oziroma trdeh X žarkov oziroma rentgenskih žarkov. It's a very collimated beam, which means that I can make beams of less than a micron, which means less than the thousandth part of a millimeter. Poleg tega je to zelo kolimiran snop, to pomeni, da je zelo koncentriran. Lahko ga koncentriram na površino snopa, prere snopa, na manj kot en mikron, torej manj kot ena tisočinko milimetra. So I can use them as a microscope. To pomeni, da jih lahko uporabljam kot mikroskop. They are pursed, which means that they have a time structure and which means that I can study the time structure of reactions. In kjer je če pulzirajoča, pomeni, da ima eno časovno komponento, časovno strukturo, kar pomeni, da jo lahko primerno uporabljam, tudi da v realnem času sledim nekim dogajanjem, recimo nekemu biološkemu razvoju. They are coherent. Coherent means that all the photons are very ordered and when they pass through something, even if it's transparent to X-rays, they are disturbed by any structure even if the structure is very thin and very light, and I can still see things that I cannot see with other sources. Potem pa najpomembnejša je to, da je dosledna. Kaj hočem s tem povedati? Fotoni so vsi zelo urejeni, so vsi v isti fazi. In to pomeni, za razliko od recimo rengenskih žarkov, ko gre do skozi sknov, ki je za rengenske žarke nevidna, ker jo ne, preprosto ni nobene prepreke, mi sicer je ne absorbira naših žarkov, ampak kjer so v isti fazi, vidimo spremembo faze in torej tudi zelo tanke in zelo redke snovi se pri našem opazovanju pokažejo. This is the typical experimental station at Electra. I have an optics hatch where I prepare the beam, so I select the wavelength, the energy, and I choose the dimension of the beam. In to je recimo en tipičen, tipična naša kontrolna oziroma eksperimentalna postaja, ki jo imamo tudi pri nas. Najprej imamo to optično kletko. Tam pripravim svetlobo, pripravim torej frekvenco, energijo, dolžino valu in tako dalje. Then I have the experimental hatch, where I have the sample I'm studying. Potem pa imam to eksperimentalno kletko ali sobico, ki ja postavim vzorec, ki ga preučujem. And then I have a control room, where I control both the X-rays, and the experiment. In potem imamo kontrolno kabino, iz katere potem nadzorujemo tako prvi pač generacijo samo ustvarjanje svetlobe in tudi pač naš vzorec v eksperimentalni kletki. Let's go to the real use of synchrotron light. I will give just a couple of examples between the thousands of examples of research that can be made and something that we have in common in our regions, in Friuli Venezia Giulia and in Slovenia, which is good food, and a very old history. In poglejmo nekaj čisto konkretnih primerov, konkretne porabe našega sinhrotrona. Imamo jih na tisoče, jaz sem izbral samo nekaj od teh vseh, ki bi jih lahko naredili in bom izbral nekaj, kar je nam skupno, tako v Furlanini, Julijski krajini, kot vaši tukaj primorski. In to je pač dobra hrana in nekaj iz zelo stare zgodovine. So, food science. Why mikroskopi is so important in food science? And... And as I said before, food is usually, is usually something light, very transparent to X-rays. So we cannot study the microstructure of food with old machines. But with synchrotron we can do it. But what, what are we looking for? In torej, recimo, začnimo z živilsko tehnologijo ali znanost o živilih. Kot se že vemo, ne, živila, torej vsa hrana je prelahka, da bi bila vidna 
z rengenskimi žarki, da bi z njo kaj karkoli lahko počeli. Medtem, ko svetloba, ki jo dobimo z sinhrotrona, je zato uporabna. In kaj nam pove mikrostruktura živil? Kaj nam tukaj, zakaj je to tako pomembno pri živilih? Just a couple of definitions. Uh, one definition is food technology is a controlled attempt to preserve, transform, create or destroy a structure imparted by nature or processing. Ampak dajmo prvo si razjasniti pojme, da vemo, o čem govorimo. Kaj je, na primer, živilska tehnologija? Preprosto povedano, živilska tehnologija nek kontroliran poskus ali neko prizadevanje da mikrostrukturo, ki jo je živil udala ali narava ali pač predelava živila, ali ohranimo, ali spremenimo, ali sploh ustvarimo oziroma jo uničimo. So, if we have a tool which can help us to understand the microstructure of food, so to give an image uh, of the structure of food, we can design processes which can improve the quality of food. In torej, če imamo v rokah orodje, oziroma če ga izumimo, da razumemo mikrostrukturo določenega živila, potem verjetno razumemo tudi lasnosti zaradi te mikrostrukture in tudi primerno oblikujemo mikrostrukturo, ker hočemo doseči pač neke lasnosti pri tem živilu. So, uh, image analysis with synchrotron radiation and, and new image processing techniques, which means software, uh, provide the quantitative data for the analysis and the design of food microstructure. In prav na sinhrotronu nam to omogoča, da imamo te kvantitativne podatke, ker imamo tudi novo programsko opremo, to se stalno razvija, in ti količinski podatki nam to potem pomagajo, da pravilno razumemo mikrostrukturo tako živil, torej hrane. So the, the, the microstructure of food and uh, the interaction of the components of food, which are mainly proteins, fat, carbohydrates, water, and of course some uh, minerals, some vitamins, etc., so some minor elements, are responsible of a lot of characteristics of food. Ampak se mi točno vemo, da mikrostruktura samih živil, predvsem pa vzajemno delovanje med vsemi sestavinami, med spojinami, ki jih imamo tam in to veste, imamo tako beljakovine kot ogrikove hidrate, vodo in tako dalje, pa tudi nekaj ostalih snovi v sledeh, pač vitamine, rudninske snovi in tako dalje. Vse to ima pomembne posledice za kakovost oziroma lastnost same snovi in torej živila. So, the microstructure of food is responsible of nutrition of food, the chemical stability, the microbiological stability, uh, we will see the texture and physical properties, what they are, transport properties and product engineering. In to so vsa področja, na katere potem mikrostruktura samega živila vpliva. Zagotovo vpliva na hranilno vrednost, gotovo vpliva na kemično obstojnost, na mikrobiološko obstojnost. Bomo v nekaj govorili tudi o sami teksturi in fizikalnih lastnosti snovi in potem o prenosnih lastnostih ter o samem oblikovanju in načrtovanju proizvodov ali izdelkov. Uh, just to give an example. Uh, you know the bread, bread, simple bread is made of four ingredients: flour, water, salt and starch. Zelo pre, pre konkreten prvi primer, kruh, navaden kruh. Vemo, da ima štiri sestavine: moka, voda, sol in škrob. With these four ingredients we can make hundreds of different kinds of bread with different tastes. So it's, and why? Because the structure of these kinds of bread are different. And the difference in the structure changes the taste of bread. In prav pri kruhu vidimo, ne? Štiri sestavine za kruh po celem svetu. In na stotine, na tisoče različnih oblik in okusov kruha. Ene hrustljav, druge drugače in tako. Zakaj? Razlikujejo se prav v mikrostrukturi. In mikrostruktura spremeni okus kruha. Why? This is because the chemical composition gives only a very limited view of the quality of the physical state and the taste of a food. Zakaj? Sama kemična sestava hrane, torej določenega živila, nam pove zelo malo o samem okusu in o strukturi hrane. For example, I have the, the same identical chemical composition of George Clooney. 
Moja kemična sestava je popolnoma enaka kot ima George Clooney. My wife says, yes, you're true, but you don't have the same structure. In se veda moja žena pravi, cej, to je res, ja, ampak struktura pa ni ista. So the taste is different. In zato je tudi okus drugače. As you know, fruit juices, vegetable puree, minced meat, carne macinata. They all have the same chemical composition of the original food, but they have completely different physical characteristics, rheological, sensorial properties. Just imagine cream. A liquid cream and whipped cream, they, are, they have the identical same composition, but they have a completely different taste. In tako imamo recimo sadni sokovi ali sadne kaše ali pa mleto meso. Vse te so po kemični sestavi popolnoma identične originalnemu sadju, iz katerega smo rodili kašo ali sok ali mesu, ki ga nismo še zmleli, ampak je struktura drugačna in zato so lastnosti drugače predelane hrane, tako fizikalne kot reološke, torej kako se snov obnaša in tudi čutne, popolnoma drugačne od surovine. Samo pomislimo na smetano. Sladka smetana je, ima en okus, stepena sladka smetana ima čisto drugi okus. So, this is why, I mean, this is because chemical composition very often ignores small quantities of, of, uh, of air, for example, in the case of, uh, of whipped cream, uh, which have a deep effect on the, on the structure of the food and, and so on the sensorial and on the general properties of the food itself. In zakaj pride do tega? Preprosto sama kemična sestava nam ničesar ne pove o manjših količinah drugih snovi, recimo v primeru stepene, sme, stepene smetane, je to zrak, ki je v zelo majhnih količinah prisoten, ampak tako močno vpliva na samo strukturo uh, celotnega pripravka na koncu, da popolnoma spremeni ne samo fizikalne lastnosti, ampak tudi druge, tudi čutne lastnosti samega uh, živila. Nutrition. Uh, very often we think that uh, vegetables in nature are more nutritious, are more healthy than, uh, than other processed foods. For example, uh, we think that carrots and tomatoes, just from the plant or from the shop, if I buy them just raw, they are very healthy. Hraniva vrednost. Vedno mislimo, da je pač zelenjava neposredno zvrta, takoj, ko jo vtrgamo v paradižnih zrastline, da je veliko bolj zdrav, kot če ga dobimo nekako predelanega. This is not true. For example, uh, antioxidants in, in tomatoes and, and in carrots, uh, so carotenoids in carrots, uh, uh, leucopenes in tomatoes, they're usually inside the small cells. Uh, when I bite a tomato, I just break a few cells, so I free only a small quantity of antioxidants. If I drink a tomato juice or a, a carrot juice, I can absorb all the good nutrients from that plant. In zakaj to ni res? Ja seveda, zato ker imamo recimo antioksidante, ki jih imamo v paradižniku ali korenčku. V korenčku so to karotenoidi, v paradižniku so to likopeni. Ko ugriznem v svež paradižnik ali odgriznem korenček, pač kolikor žvečim odvisno od mojih zob, zato ker so vsi ti antioksidanti razpršeni po celicah. Toliko celic, koliko razbijem, toliko antioksidantov dobim, kar je precej malo. Če popijem sok paradižnika ali korenčkov sok, je to zmleto in veliko višja je absorpcijska stopnja. What we study at Eletra is the relationship between the structure of the cells and the ability of food to release micronutrients, which are very important, to our body. In prav to preučujemo v elektri, prav to razmerje med celicami, v katerih se nahajajo hranila in absorpcijsko zmožnost ali biološko razpoložljivost teh snovi. Uh, another important field is so-called mass transport. Uh, the microstructure is responsible for the transport of liquids inside a food. You know, very often chocolate has that kind of, of white th things on top, which is the, the cocoa butter which comes out, it's called blooming. And, and it's, it's not dangerous, but uh, we know that if we study uh, a technique to make a microstructure of, of chocolate which uh, stops the cocoa butter inside, the blooming does not appear. In tako je, na primer, mikrostruktura vpliva tudi na prenos snovi v samih 
proizvodi. Recimo cvetenje čokolade, to je tisti pojav, ko je čokolada malo starejša ali se je zgodi nekaj, da potem pride, dobije tako belo na površini. Ni nič nevarnega, ni estetsko. Če bomo pravilno prištudirali mikrostrukturo čokolade, bomo uspeli morda to preprečiti in se bo čokolada bolje prodajala. Or for example, we give uh, uh, suggestions to the, to the industry in order to make a cornflakes or croissant which absorb milk or cafe latte in, in the optimal way. Lahko na primer svetujemo proizvajalcem hrane, ne? kako narediti tak roglič ali pa recimo take kosmiče, ki bodo bolje absorbirali recimo mleko ali pa belo kavo. Uh, sensorial properties are important as well. Uh, we, we gave the example of bread, where the, the microstructure is responsible for the taste. But there are a lot of characteristics which are not related to the taste or to the smell of food, which are important for the definition of a pleasant food. Govorili smo še o čutnih lastnostih, ki jih določa mikrostruktura. Omenili smo kruh, ki spremeni okus samo zaradi mikrostrukture. Ampak pomislite, koliko imamo drugih vidikov, ki niso samo okus in vonj, pa močno vplivajo na to, kako uživamo v določeni hrani. Another example. Do you know the ice cream manium? Is it good? Yeah. You know why it's good? Well, it's not just because the ingredients are good. But the main characteristic of manium is the noise which makes when you break it with your teeth. No, sladoled magnum poznate, ne? In je dober, zakaj je dober, ja, ni okus, ne? Naj prva prodajna, prodajni razlog, uspešnica je prav zaradi zvoka, ki ga naredi, ko grizne to čokolado. So, sound engineers gave to the chemists the information they needed in order to make a good noise. Ker so bili prav tehniki zvoka, so točno kemikom dali na vodila, kako narediti čokolado, kakšen zvok mora narediti, da bo, se bo ta čokolada bolje prodajala. And the chemist found out that if we melt the chocolate in a very slow way, it will be more resistant and it will make the right noise. In kemiki so preprosto odkrili, če čokolado počasi, ampak zelo počasi stopi, stopimo, bo struktura veliko bolj odporna in torej se bo tudi lomla na zelo bolj, bolj hrupen način. But the examples are thousands. Just to make another one, uh, cheese. Uh, why there is difference between uh, mozzarella and parmigiano? Because the microstructure is different. And this microstructure change, changes everything else. Uh, the way you preserve it in the fridge. Mozzarella, you can, after two days, you have to throw it away. Parmigiano, you can keep it one month in the fridge. That's because the structure is responsible always also for the bacterial transmission inside the food. Mamo, ne šteto primero, ampak dajmo samo še primer sira. Spet je sve odvisno od mikrostrukture. Zakaj je razlika, takšna razlika med mozzarello in parmezanom? Parmezan nam bo ostal v hladilniku cel mesec, mozzarello po dveh dneh lahko vržemo proč. Spet zaradi mikrostrukture, zaradi tega, ker je od mikrostrukture odvisno tudi, kako hitro se bojo bakterije razmnoževale in širile po siru. Okay, just to give another example, I said uh, we, we shared Trieste, Gorizia, Nova Gorizia, all this area share a common history. Uh, one very important historical fact in, in, uh, in this area was the presence of uh, good violin makers, of, uh, of a quality which, which was appreciated in whole Europe in the, in the last two centuries. In spet, če gremo na drugi vidik našega skupnega nekako območja ozemlja, ter, ter med Trstom Gorico in Novo Gorico, kaj imamo skupnega? Je skupno zgodovino, zagotovo. In v zgodovini velja omeniti to, da smo imeli zelo dobre izdelovalce violin. Zelo so cenili njihove izdelke pač v zadnjih 200 letih po celi uh, in, Evropi. In general, there are a lot of topics which are important in, uh, in the study of, of musical instruments. Uh, restoration and conservation of ancient mus uh, instruments. We want to know how these instruments were made in the past. We want to know why they produce a certain kind of sound. Uh, we want to, to have an economical valuation. There are instruments, violins mm, uh, of, the, of the 18th century in Italy, which can be worth 15 million euros. And 
there is a big market, both in Italy and in Slovenia, of the fabrication of replicas, so copies of ancient instruments. In seveda ogromno vidiko je pri starih instrumentih. Zagotovo je tukaj vprašanje samega restauriranja in ohranjanja, da ne propadejo. Zagotovo bi radi tudi izvedeli, kako so jih sploh naredili in katere tehnike so uporabljali. Zagotovo je tukaj tudi analiza zvoka in kako instrument zveni. Potem pa imamo gospodarski vidik. Sami veste, da imamo določene italijanske violine, ki se prodajajo tudi ena, antičen seveda, po 15 milijonov evrov, bodo šteli za njo. In potem obstaja velik trg, tako v Italiji, pa tudi v Sloveniji, kopij starih inštrumentov, ki se danes izdelujejo. What Synchrotron can make in this field is to make non-destructive analysis, which are very important. We can analyze the samples of big dimensions in very good environmental conditions. Uh, with very good spatial resolution, so we can look at very, very small details uh, and in very fast times. Kaj lahko tukaj sinhrotron naredi? Zagotovo najpomembne je, je to, da naše analizije, analize ne poškodujejo uh, predmeta. To je seveda tukaj zelo pomembno. Zagotovo lahko preučimo inštrumente, ki so precej veliki in pri tem jih imamo v zelo kontroliranem okolju. Imamo zagotovljeno zelo visoko prostorsko ločljivost, to boste še videli, in v zelo kratkem času. I will just give a couple of examples. This is a very important organ. It's the only surviving organ where the pipes are made with carton. Dam nekaj primerov. To so zelo pomembne orgle, ker so to edine orgle, ki so se ohranile do danes, pri katerih so cevi izdelane iz kartona. It's not a solution to make a cheap organ, because these organs were much more expensive than classical ones, because they were much more difficult to make and to preserve and to tune. And they were owned only by very, very rich people. Uh, Lorenzo de' Medici, Isabella d'Este, King of Hungary. In Zakaj so se vi delali iz kartona? Ne zato, ker bi bilo ceneje. Te orgle dejansko so bile veliko dražje od drugih. In te so si lahko privoščili res samo najvidnejši in najbogatejši, torej Lorenzo di Medici, Izabela d'Este, Mađarski kralj in tako dalje. In this case, the restorators in Venice wanted to know in a non-destructive way how these pipes were made, so without cutting them. And X-rays was not possible, because these pipes were transparent to X-rays. In restauratori iz Benetk so preprosto hoteli vedeti, kako so te cevi sploh narejene. Opcija ni bila ta, da odrežejo pa pogledajo skozi. Rentgenskih žarkov niso mogli uporabiti, ker je papir na rentgenskih žarkih nevidan. Well, as I said, synchrotron radiation is different. So this is what we could see with very good resolution. This is just like a virtual cut of the pipe. So we can see the carton, which is rolled around the wooden center. And we can we can determine the kind of wood which was wood which was used inside the instrument and we can even see that there are still present some insects which are biting and eating the wood no na sinhrotronu pa smo to lahko naredili v nekako smo cel virtualno prerezali presekali in se lepo vide kako je karton oziroma papir zvit kako imamo les in lahko tudi opredelimo katera vrsta lesa je in smo celo zasledili nekaj škodljivcev nekaj insektov ki so tam malo nekaj malo manega požrli The same thing applies to violins, which are very important and very precious. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, this is a kind of tomography. Tomography is the same technique uh, which is applied in, in hospitals. And this is a tomography of a violin, uh, of my old violin when I was a kid, to be sincere. And so this is a virtual, non-destructive cut uh, of a violin. Just to give a comparison, this is what we can see With, convention, oh, sorry, with conventional instruments. No, to je pa tomografija, torej isto kot zdravniška uh, CT analiza. Uh, to je moja violina iz mojega otroštva in sem jo pregledal s sinhrotronom, dobim to ločljivost. Če pa uporabljim najboljši uh, CT, ki je razpoložljiv na uh, medicinskem področju, potem je posnetek zgleda takole. Uh, The last example is an example in uh, archaeology. Uh, we wanted to try something new and to see what we could, uh, what kind of information 
we could have from uh, uh, fossil teeth from this area. No, in zadnji primer je primer iz arheologije. Malo smo se odločili, da poskusimo, kaj vse lahko naredimo in smo rekli, kako zgledajo fosilizirani zobje iz najdbine nedaleč od naših krajev. So, the teeth with, with the A is a, uh, is, a, is a tooth we looked with a conventional instrument. In torej, pod sliko A imamo zob oziroma podočnik, ki smo ga videli z enim klasičnim instrumentom, torej X žarki, rentgen, navadne rentgen. B and C are seen with synchrotron. And we see that the, the yellow thing is not visible with the other instrument. So it's something different. Medtem, ko slike B in na, pod B in C so pa narejene s synchrotronom in vidimo, da se nam ne, na B in na C prikazalo nekaj rumenega česar, na sliki A ni. So we tried with another technique, again at the synchrotron, with infrared spectroscopy, and they told us it was b walks. In potem smo šli v drugi laboratori v sinkrotronu in smo rekli, pogledajte, kaj nam kaj je ta snov, ki smo jo opazili. In z infrarodečo spektroskopijo so pogledali in so rekli, to je čebeli vosek. Uh, so we tried to, to understand the age of the walks and the tooth with uh, carbon-14 techniques and we found that they had the same identical age. In ko smo to potem uh, z tehniko uh, oglika 14 skušali ugotoviti še starost tako zob kot tudi Čebelega voska nam je povedalo, da je starost približno ista. So we tried again a tomography of these, these teeth and we found out that the wax had penetrated in the cracks which uh, were made before the death of the owner of the tooth. Potem smo naredili še dodatne analize in odkrili, da je vosek dejansko šel vnotranjo zoba, v to razpoko, do konca, vendar dokler je bil še človek živ. This means that just by chance we found uh, the, the very first uh, dental operation on a, on, a, on a man, on a human, made in history of, of, of mankind. In torej, čisto po naključju smo odkrili prvi zobozdravniški poseg v zgodovini človeštva. Sometimes lucky, being lucky helps. <laughs> In časih pač sreča tudi pomaga, ne? <laughs> ok, I just wanted to give you very few examples of what we can make. Uh, we can, we have applications in medicine, in chemistry, in physics, in biology, uh, in, in instrumentation, in material science, uh, uh, in mammography. You, you tell one and we can do it. Uh, What I suggest you is to come to Trieste, to see our lab, to visit our beamlines, to have an idea of what we can do. Uh, we are very happy to have guests, uh, especially young people who tomorrow will be the scientists of the next generation and will be able to use instruments like this one. And the same for small and medium companies. Uh, we have a lot of collaborations with small and medium companies because together We can, uh, we can have funds, for example, from the European Commission and, uh, and trying to, to do something different. Um, both Italy and Slovenia, they have a very good tradition in science uh, and in technology, and we should try to think about something new to develop our countries. Toliko sem hotel z enkrat povedati, predvsem zato, da Predstavim, kaj vse počnemo. Dejansko pa imamo aplikacije, ki jih imamo, upravljamo tako v medicini, v kemiji, v fiziki, v bioloških vedah, v tehnologijah in znanostih osnovi os in osnoveh, v neštetih aplikacijah. Vi samo povejte nekaj in mi imamo že to zmišljeno. Tako da vas lepo vabim, da nas obiškajte v Trstu, v našem laboratorju. Predvsem smo zelo gostoljubni, radi vidimo goste, predvsem mlade, te mlade, ki bodo znanstveniki nekega jutrišnjega dne. V, pa tudi srednje velika in mala podjetja, ker je ogromno idej, ki se lahko porodijo v našem laboratoriju, oziroma še že tam samo čakajo. Ogromno imamo primeru zelo dobrega sodelovanja s proizvajalci, s podjetji, torej s gospodarstvom. In torej dodatno priložnosti imamo tudi to, ker lahko sodelujemo čez mejo, se tukaj ponujejo priložnosti za financiranje in lahko črpamo sredstva, ki so na razpolago, ki jih je Evropska komisija dala na razpolago. Tako Italija kot Slovenija se lahko poja, po, pohvali z dobrimi znanstveniki in z dobrimi dosežki na tem področju in mislim, da lahko so sodelovanje res doseže dobre rezultate. Tako da res dobrodošli. Thank you very much.
If you have any questions, Prashanya. Quali sono i valori di energia che si usano per le varie applicazioni, dal dente al violino? Uh, depends. For example, for the, for the tooth is uh, about 34 kilo electron volts, and for the violin is about 20 kilo electron volts. For food, it goes down to 15 kilo electron volts. But it's a monochromatic beam, so it's, a, it's not invasive, just like mm, polychromatic beams. Okay, I have lost all of them. <laughs> Could you understand? <laughs> okay, perfetto. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the important thing is that we, we can really select the, en the, the right energy for the single experiment. This is a big advantage of synchrotron. Proto je prednost synchrotrona, da lahko točno umerimo, katero red energije uporabimo za katero aplikacijo. No, it's true. Uh, in this way, especially uh, I've been grown up with, uh, with the apple, <laughs> like this. Uh, it's more healthy because uh, the nature tries to preserve these micronutrients and close them in cells. So bacteria does, do not attack. Uh, there, are, there is no oxidation. And, but we want to free them. So if we want to free these micronutrients, we have to, to, to break the, the, the highest number of cells as possible. Ne, to je popolno mares. Narava, narava skuša ohranit in zaščiti sa ta mikrohranila s tem, da jih zapira v celice, da jih zaščiti pred bakterijami, pred oksidacijo, pred vsem. Mi pa moramo narediti nasprotno, mi jih moramo sprostiti. To pomeni, da moramo čim več celic odpreti. Dunque è molto meglio grattugiare, fare dei succhi che mangiarli mordendo. Di solito sì. Mi ha parlato di coia. Usually yes. <laughs> But the taste is different. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you again. <laughs> wow.